Well, hello, good morning. <laughs> Glad to see you made it to church safely. <clears throat> All your batteries are working apparently. <clears throat> so we've come now to the finale of this series that began at the start of Advent, that continued on through Christmas and through Epiphany, and now is ending with a story that, quite honestly, many people don't even real, don't realize is even a part of Luke's narrative about the births of John and Jesus. But it's actually a very important point in Luke's presentation of his gospel. It, it's, it's, in fact, something that's going to echo throughout the gospel of Luke and on to the end of the book of Acts. Our passage this morning tells us about two old people <clears throat> who encountered a baby. And yet, when they saw him, they weren't just happy about seeing a baby and thinking about the days when their children were babies. No, they recognized that something extraordinary had happened something unique. God had showed up, and everything would be different from then on. I, I called this series, Waiting for Christmas, Waiting for God. And there's an ironic aspect to that title. We're accustomed to waiting for Christmas. We learn about it at a young age. Gradually, we adapt to this idea of looking forward to Christmas and being content to wait because we know it'll be here soon. We aren't as accustomed to being content when it comes to waiting for God, perhaps because we're not as confident that he will actually come through for us. You remember our two tramps, Vladimir and Estragon, from the second sermon in the series? Nod your, of course you do, nod your head, even if you're not sure. These are the two main characters in Samuel Beckett's play, Waiting for Godot, two miserable people who repeat pointless conversations while waiting for Godot to come and help them. But Godot never shows up. Much of the world thinks about waiting for God the way Beckett thinks about God, waiting for God. A pointless, futile, empty hope made by foolish, miserable people. Well, in truth, the first century wasn't all that different. Waiting for God to show up, or for the gods if you weren't Jewish, that, that sounds like something a pious thing to do for all those people who lived hundreds of years ago or thousands of years ago in the stories about our ancestors. But for most people, waiting for God was almost like a fantasy. It sounded wonderful, it wasn't likely ever to happen, just like Vladimir and Estragon. But Luke tells us about two different people, Simeon and Anna, two old people who had each seen plenty of misery in their lives. Simeon had lived most of his life, if not all of it, under Roman occupation that had begun some 60 years previously, which had ended the brief years of Jewish independence under the Hasmonean kings, and God had promised him that he would see the Messiah before he died. And Simeon had grown old waiting for God to fulfill that promise. <clears throat> Simeon had seen lots of people come and go in the temple over the years. He had seen lots of opportunities for God to end the suffering of his people. And still, the Messiah hadn't come. It would have been easy to lose heart. Simeon held fast to the promise of God, kept waiting for that day when he would see with his eyes the consolation of Israel. Anna had lived under that same oppression during the same years of waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem, waiting for the day when those pagan armies would be driven out of the land, would no longer pollute the holy city of the living God. And she had her own personal miseries as well. She was a widow who had been widowed after only seven years of marriage and then decade after decade after decade of living alone, completely dependent upon the generosity of strangers and family. But her life was filled with hope. Her days were filled with fasting and prayers, the, the two spiritual weapons left to an old impoverished woman. Simeon and Anna were devout, devout Jews living in the holy city of Jerusalem, spending their days in and around the temple, the, the holiest symbol in all of Judaism. Luke tells us that they were righteous, that is, they were observant Jews. They were careful to keep the law of God, careful to live according to the commandments of God. But not only were they devout, they both were people who knew God's voice. They heard from God. They were prophetic people, people of the Spirit, who were tuned into God's heart because they listened to his voice. 
because they held fast to the promises of God, remained steadfast in their faith, they were, they were there in the temple to witness the day when God did show up. Now, throughout these stories of the birth of John and Jesus, I'm sorry, <clears throat> moved my page too fast. <laughs> Let's pause for just a moment here. That was what I was supposed to say. <clears throat> Do you realize it's okay sometimes to goof up? All right. Remember that thought. Remember that thought a lot when you think of me. <clears throat> Let's pause for a moment. Okay. Remember that Luke is telling his story for an audience that includes a lot of people like Theophilus, these God-fearing Gentiles who identify with the Jewish community, worship their God, believe their scriptures. He wants to convince them of the truth of the gospel, the of gospel about Jesus. So he keeps introducing characters into the story who are reputable Jewish people whom his audience is going to respect. Simeon and Anna, these devout, righteous Jews who are, in whom the Spirit is, is living and through whom he's speaking, they are important witnesses. And their testimony is, is the testimony that Luke wants to emphasize for his audience. They represent God's voice to Luke's readers. They are God's they are presenting God's validation of the message he is presenting. This gospel that Luke is proclaiming, this, this good news about God fulfilling his promises to Israel, the good news about Jesus and the salvation that he offers to those who will repent and believe, who are going to become disciples, this gospel has been sent to Israel and now to the Gentiles. This gospel, Luke says, has God's stamp of approval all over it. And it's confirmed by these holy prophets, these devout Jews, for all who will listen. Now, <clears throat> our passage today focuses on two very important ideas for Luke. Two interconnected themes that, <clears throat> as I said at the opening, are going to continue to be emphasized throughout all of Luke and Acts. <clears throat> the first theme he wants to introduce is that God has fulfilled his promise to Israel, has sent his Messiah to them to bring them salvation. Think back to the message of Christmas Eve. When, If we look back just a few verses, we hear the announcement of the angels to the shepherds when they say, Today in the city of David there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ, that is Messiah, the Lord. And this was good news for the Jewish people, good news that they wanted to hear. The problem, of course, was that the fulfillment didn't look exactly like what they were expecting. So Luke has to explain all of that, and he will throughout the gospel. The second theme that he wants his readers to notice, and to notice very clearly, is that God has sent this same salvation beyond Israel, beyond his covenant people, to the rest of the world. He has sent salvation to the nations, to the Gentiles, these unclean pagans who worship false gods. Not only has he provided a way for them somehow to escape hell, he's actually invited them to become part of God's covenant people. Now this was great news for the Gentiles, but it was shocking news to the Jews. Shocking as in outrageous, impossible, blasphemous even. And so it meant that God's people would look very different than either the Jews or the Gentiles imagined. So Luke has to explain all of that as well. Now most of that he defers to the book of Acts. But he introduces it to us in this crucial passage. Now more about that in just a minute. Now, throughout these stories, the birth of John and Jesus... Luke has repeatedly made another point of emphasis. He repeatedly mentions the Holy Spirit. It's an emphasis that he particularly wants his audience to catch. On our passage, it shows up quite strongly. Luke wants his readers, and that includes you and me, to understand that God speaks to his people and to the world through prophetic persons who are filled with the Holy Spirit. And by repeatedly mentioning the Holy Spirit in connection with these prophetic pronouncements, Luke is showing us that God, through his Holy Spirit, affirms and validates, number one, he affirms and validates these acts and these events that are happening are God's work. This is what God has done and is doing in the world. Secondly, he, he, the, the Spirit affirms and validates that these people, these individuals, are speaking for God. They're not just nice people. They're not even just devout people. They are God's spokespersons. And thirdly then, he's affirming that the message that these spokespersons are saying about what God is doing, that this is true. And thus, by implication, that his gospel, 
what he's proclaiming is also true. So let's go back to our story now. After Jesus is born, Mary and Joseph have him circumcised in accordance with the law. According to Leviticus chapter 12, verses 1 to 3, the law commands that males are to be circumcised eight days after birth. And then the rest of uh, Leviticus 12 explains what sacrifice is to be offered for ritual purification after childbirth and when it's to be done. And the law required that a one-year-old lamb would be sacrificed as a burnt offering and then a dove or a pigeon as a sin offering. But it made a concession, a, a stipulated that for the poor, those who could not afford the cost of a lamb, they were permitted to substitute a second pigeon or a dove for that lamb. So when Joseph and Mary come to Jerusalem and come to the temple, they're going to offer the required sacrifice for purification. Luke tells us they brought two pigeons, two doves, for the purificatory offering, which tells us that Luke, uh, that Luke, that Mary and Joseph were among the very poorest of the poor in Israel. Now, Joseph and Mary weren't the only ones in the temple that day. There were lots of people. They weren't the only ones offering sacrifices. The temple would have been filled with people. There would have been vendors selling sacrificial animals, people bringing or buying animals for sacrifice, priests making the sacrifices, Levites setting up and cleaning up after the sacrifices, people praying, beggars begging. It would have been filled with people, crowds of people, all busy fulfilling their religious obligations, intent on trying to please God or to gain his favor, or somehow to obtain his help, his blessing for their lives. Crowds of unseeing people, oblivious, milling about, completely blinded to this ordinary couple. Who's going to notice another couple of peasants in, the, in their infant child? Now, maybe someone gave them a half smile, a kind of a knowing nod. You know, oh, I said, baby, can you imagine the comments? Like, oh, good luck raising a child in this world. Or, you're happy now, just wait. You know, a son, that's good, if he lives. Probably most people just sort of kept to themselves and just thought, oh, oh hey, another hungry mouth, another empty stomach. And so just as it was when he was born, almost no one paid attention the first time the Son of God enters into his father's house. Almost no one is paying any attention when the God shows up in the very place that's supposed to house his presence, only he shows up and he's not hidden in the inner sanctum of the Holy of Holies. He shows up in the arms of his mother. And the presence of God comes into the temple and nobody notices except one man notices. One old man had come into the temple that day listening to the Holy Spirit. He was focused on the promise of God. God was going to send a Redeemer, the Messiah. God was going to bring comfort and consolation for Israel. He was going to put an end to the suffering. God was going to let him see the Messiah before he died. And it didn't matter that he was old. What mattered was that God had said what he would do. So when Simeon came into the temple that day, his focus wasn't on the sacrifices that had to be made. His focus wasn't on the things that needed to be set up or cleaned up. His focus wasn't on the crowds or the animals or the religious functions being carried out throughout the temple courts. He wasn't even focused on his own needs. He was there to hear from God, to be led by the Spirit. And then something happened that he had been waiting to see happen for a very long time. He saw a baby. Baby being carried by a peasant woman. A baby that looked like every other baby he'd ever seen. Here in the temple, a woman who looked like all the other mothers he had ever seen. A couple here in the temple to offer a sacrifice like all the other couples he'd ever seen. This baby was different though. Because Simeon was sensitized to the Holy Spirit. And so his own spirit is drawn to this baby that was conceived by the power of the Spirit of God in whom the Spirit of God dwelt bodily. And so he immediately starts moving through the temple courts until he's beside Mary and Joseph. And then, without even asking permission, he takes the baby from their arms and holds it and he begins to prophesy over the child. Now, the first part of his prophecy corresponds to the first theme I mentioned earlier. God has not only fulfilled his promise to Israel, but he has fulfilled his promise to Simeon. He has sent the Messiah. And Simeon 
has been, can see it. He's revealed his identity to this old man. My eyes have seen your salvation, he says. Now think about that. What has he seen? Simeon has seen a baby. A fragile, vulnerable baby held by peasants in a world ruled by power and cruelty and selfishness and indifference. And yet Simon, Simeon can say, I've seen your promised salvation. Nothing had changed in the government. Nothing had changed in society. The sick and the weak and the poor and the outcast were all still in need of help. But everything had changed because God had showed up. The world was still sick and the disease still prevailed everywhere, but the cure had been introduced into the world and had begun to do its work. Salvation was born and it was present in this baby. Now the second part of his prophecy corresponds to the second of Luke's themes that I mentioned earlier. Simeon announces this baby is going to be a light of revelation to the Gentiles. That is, he's going to be the instrument for God's revelation of himself to the pagan world, those worshipers of false gods who lived in darkness. God had revealed himself to them through the Jewish Messiah, the King of Israel. And this revelation isn't just a matter of bringing some factual knowledge to these Gentiles. It's not a kind of revelation that just demonstrates how evil they are and how hopelessly lost and condemned you are. No, God's revelation of himself meant that he'd also offered them salvation. These Gentiles, whom the Pharisees regarded as fuel for the fires of hell, that God had created them to be fuel for the fires of hell, that's what the Pharisees believed, they were going to be offered a chance to be saved and to join the people of God. This theme is so very, very important for Luke. It is absolutely central to his purpose in writing. It is crucial to his theology. It's dear to his heart. It's right at the core of his being. And he's going to ring this bell over and over and over again, especially when he gets to the second volume, which we know as the book of Acts. And yet here, when he's announcing this theme at the very start of his gospel, he does so with a subtlety and restraint that's absolutely amazing. You see, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> our English translations cannot capture Luke's subtlety because the English language doesn't have a way to do what Luke did when he wrote this in the original Greek, Koine Greek. So I'm going to try to explain very simply what's hidden here in, in, the, in the original Greek. Luke uses this word salvation many, many times in his two books, many, many times. But here... He uses an unusual form of the word. In verse 30, when Simeon says, My eyes have seen your salvation, that's not the regular form of the word, though it has exactly the same meaning. And Luke only uses this unusual form of the word three times in all of Luke Acts. He uses this in chapter 3. He's going to use it as he quotes from the prophet Isaiah, from the Greek translation known as the Septuagint, Prophet Isaiah, in this phrase, all flesh, meaning all people, all people, will see the salvation of God. That word salvation is this unusual form. So Luke read Isaiah, saw that unusual form of the word for salvation, and noticed that it was in the context of God promising to send salvation to all peoples. And so then he uses that same unusual form in two places, and only two places in Luke Acts. One is right here in our passage today at the very opening of his gospel when Simeon is announcing God's sending of salvation to the Gentiles. And the other time he uses it is at the very close of the book of Acts in the last few verses when Paul says this salvation is being sent to the Gentiles. So Luke is using this unusual form of the word, something that might catch the ear of a person who's listening to someone read the book because it's going to be pronounced slightly differently. He's marking this crucial idea at the opening and the closing of his story. It's like a pair of bookends, we'd say. Marks to say this is significant, to drive home this shocking, scandalous idea that the Gentiles were loved by God, were being offered salvation and a place in his kingdom. But it's very subtle. Now, the third part of, Luke's, of uh, Simeon's prophecy is a little bit more challenging, and that's the part I want to focus our attention on as we come to the close of this series, Simeon has the Messiah in his arms. 
And he doesn't start declaring how, how wonderful or powerful he's going to be when he grows up. He doesn't start proclaiming how majestic his kingdom's going to be or, or how wide his extent's going to be. He doesn't even praise him for how righteous or just his rule is going to be or how magnanimous he's going to be. No, what he says is, this child's going to divide Israel. He's going to be a divider, not a uniter. He's going to be a divider, not a uniter. He's going to bring controversy and conflict. He's going to be the cause for upheaval among the people. He's going to upset the world. People will oppose him. They'll be provoked by him. This innocent-looking child is going to be at the center of a conflict that's going to rip Israel in two. And he's going to be rejected by many, and ultimately he's going to be killed. But he's also going to be the one who reveals what is actually in their hearts as they make their choice whether to stand with him or against him. Now, Simeon's prophecy came true, of course. Luke's gospel in the book of Acts vividly going to demonstrate how accurately that old prophet spoke when he said what would happen as the people of Israel encountered Jesus. There were some who believed and followed, who acknowledged him as Messiah, and there were many who scorned and despised him and rejected his claim. And nothing has changed. Jesus is still dividing the world. He's still dividing cities. He's even dividing families. And that innocent baby whom the world embraces for a few weeks at Christmas, he didn't come into this world to coo and be the object of smiling gazes. He came to be king. And to force the question upon us, will you swear allegiance to him and serve him, or will you continue to insist on ruling your own life? Only those who belong to him will be the people of God. Simeon recognized that God had shown up that day in the temple, and he saw God's salvation in this baby. He wasn't being sentimental. And that phrase isn't sentimental when I say it, that salvation is in a baby, as if all babies are somehow signs of God's salvation. Simeon wasn't saying, oh, you can see God when you look at a baby. No. He, he, he doesn't believe that babies are somehow perfect like God. He wasn't saying that God is in every baby. He said, this baby is different than every other baby. This is different from every other person. It's the Son of God, the Messiah, the only one who can bring God's salvation. So if I understand that truth, then all the noise, the confusion of the religious claims in our world fall to the side. Jesus is still dividing the world, and the conflict over him is still raging. But if you hear the Holy Spirit, if you recognize that God has showed up in this baby Jesus... You're not going to be caught in the middle of the conflict because you've chosen to side with him. The only source of God's salvation, the only mediator, Paul writes, between God and people. And here's why it's so very important to remember this. See, if, if we've said yes to Jesus, if we've recognized that in Jesus we've encountered God, then like Simeon, we can be at peace. Even in the face of a lot of things that aren't finished being made right yet. One of the things I've discovered over the years is it's extremely easy to begin as a follower of Jesus and then get sucked into being a follower of a cause. Instead of being a follower of Christ, living in love with Him and deriving my life from Him, I just become a follower of another cause, driven by the need to advance my cause, to defend it against the opponents, to to convince everyone I know that you too must also embrace this cause, to proclaim its importance, in fact, its supremacy over all other causes. And the more fervently I champion my cause, the more it sucks the life out of me and those around me. It becomes a chain around my waist like Jacob Marley. And whatever good it may have done at one time, it's lost as that cause consumes me. You see, we have to remember as Christians we are called always to follow a person, not a cause. Christianity is, is not a set of ideas. There is a set of ideas that are consistent with Christian faith. Christianity is not a plan for moral living. There are moral standards that are inherent in Christian faith. 
But Christianity is not a social system. Well, there are social systems, or social aspects to our life together with Jesus. Go ahead and go to that next slide. No, Christian faith, Christian theology, <clears throat> our life in the church are always built upon this. We are followers of a person. I'm sorry, I, I spoke too soon. Go, you, go back one, I think. Anyway, anyway don't, worry. don't worry about it. There are lots of good causes. Okay? God may lead you to support certain causes. He may, in fact, call you to be deeply involved in causes. And that cause might be something as important as human trafficking, ending that, or, or supporting the persecuted church. It could be something as simple as helping our church's involvement with Link. But whatever your involvement in a cause is, that's never the main point of your life, and it's never the primary mark of your allegiance to Christ. It's just something you do, something that God's called you to do. We're still called to follow him, to follow the person of Jesus before and above everything else. Because salvation is still revealed in that baby, in the person of Jesus, not in causes. So let's not be like those unseeing eyes in the temple that day, just focused on all the religious things we have to do, all of the obligations that we have, all of the stuff that we're supposed to be ha happening. Let's not be those who missed God when he showed up because we were too busy trying to win his favor or get his approval or get his blessing on this project. Let's be like Simeon and Anna, spirit-led people who recognize Jesus, the presence, the fullness of the living God in the person of him and follow him, not concerning ourselves with trying to please the populace and their ever-shifting demands. And, and let's follow Anna's example. When Anna saw Jesus, she recognized him as Messiah. She understood God showed up and was about to do something great, so she just started telling everybody. And she sought out those who were spiritually minded, who were looking for the redemption of, of Jerusalem. People who were interested in the good of the nation had something in common with God's good ends, and so she began to speak to them. There's a time to speak to, about Jesus to people who don't want to hear about him, but that's, that's for another time right now. Let me close with this. Maybe you've been waiting for God to do something for you. Maybe you've been waiting for a prayer you've prayed to be answered or <clears throat> some indicator to tell you what to do or how to handle the challenges, the decisions that are coming your way. Maybe there's a secret hope you've carried for a long time and kind of given up on, all, even though you're kind of sure that God spoke it to you sometime. I, I don't know. Maybe you're waiting for God to prove himself to you, to prove that he's real, not in some generic sense, but that he's real and you can know him. Here's what Luke offers you this morning, if you're waiting on God. Here's what our series leads to this. We have a reliable report from reputable people who are inspired by the Holy Spirit, who came into the temple in Jerusalem one day and recognized God had shown up in Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Mary, in spite of the fact that no one around recognized it, except the two of them. And in spite of the fact that nothing changed around them in some miraculous way right then, everything was different because Jesus, in Jesus, the person of God showed up and life would never be the same. The cure had been introduced into the world. So if you'll listen to their voice, if you'll believe their words, you can do that too. You can know that peace. You can follow him. And if you follow as you give him your allegiance, he's going to start pouring himself into you and all those challenges that you're wanting to know about, all those questions that you have, all of the prayers that you're wondering if they're ever going to be answered, all of that can sort itself out as you discover what it means to live as a follower of Jesus. Trust me, it, he'll sort it all out. For us, for you, for the world. Let's pray. Lord, we don't have all the answers. We, we don't know what to do all the time. Barely sure we know the questions sometimes. But I, I do ask, Lord, that you'd convince us of this, that salvation has come in a baby. Not just a baby, but a, an infant who grew up to become our Savior. 
Salvation came in the person of Jesus. The living God came in him. And so we'll follow. We'll follow. We'll follow his way, not ways of our own making. We'll follow what he says, not what we think he ought to have said. We'll follow him, not good causes. Help us to do that, Lord. In Jesus' name.